Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we're here continuing part two of our interview with Skip Press and the Celebrity Center. Skip, welcome to the show. Great to be back. Now, Skip, we left our audience on part one talking about Jerry Seinfeld and his career in Scientology. And it's much more extensive than people think, so why don't you tell us about it? Okay, in 1977, I left the uh, uh, Celebrity Center staff and uh, was, you know, out, out on my own, living across the street uh, in the Shangri Lodge apartments where a, a lot of people uh, that were Scientologists lived. And um, a lady from New York came out and she was teaching improv classes. She was uh, doing something at the AO, I believe. Her name was Tamara Wilcox. Later, she became Tamara Wilcox Smith, and she had the uh, biggest improvisational group in uh, New York City. They were they were quite uh, popular, and uh, I was in the class. And uh, Larry Anderson, who later became the intro guy, was in the class, and I I'd met uh, Larry at a giant party that Paul McCartney and Wings gave. And uh, when I was still on staff, and uh, myself and Spanky Taylor and her husband and uh, Chick Corea and Gail, his uh, girlfriend at the time, all went to the party because of somebody I knew and McCartney's staff. And then we got Larry Anderson in to Scientology, and he got into it because he thought it would advance his career, even though Larry was one of the acts at this uh, $250,000 party. So anyway, that's a little that's a little bit of background, and I could say more about all the English people that were around Scientology and stuff. But um, Tamara gave this class, and I got to know her pretty well. And I had been writing her when I was uh, on staff, and I was uh, the head of the the Department of Procurement. And so she looked me up when she came out, and so she told me about Jerry. And Jerry had been uh, in her improv classes, and he had been around the Celebrity Center in New York, which was the biggest celebrity center other than Los Angeles. And he had gone up through grade four in auditing. And now, what, no, Skip, let me jump in here. Now, Jerry Seinfeld claims he did a few classes in 76, but grade four for New Scientology uh, watchers. That's actually the last step before the state of clear. So that's quite advanced. That's right. And so, you know, uh, the first one is uh, what grade zero has to do with communication. Correct. And, uh, you know, go, goes on up and handles your sins against yourself and other people and all kinds of things like that. And so Jerry apparently did that. And I said, really? Well, we, you know, and I, you know, I knew a little bit about who Jerry Seinfeld was by uh, 1978 this was but he you know it's long before his show or anything but uh, Tamara said it in a matter of fact way said he was a big comedian and she had no reason to make up him uh, going through grade four because she was uh, kind of excited about it because you know then he might have gone clear he might have been a real solid Scientologist and that would be another feather in the celebrity center type uh, uh, roster you know we certainly would have had a different Seinfeld show had Jerry stayed in Scientology. Yeah, anyway. and then late, later he made uh, jokes about uh, Scientologists on uh, on Seinfeld. There was one uh, bit that I saw today where this girl drives away angrily, and he's with two or three of the other characters, and he goes, "Oh, those Scientologists! They're, they're so angry." <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, I remember that. Like so anyway, so he can say whatever he wants, but I'm I'm pretty convinced he went up through grade four. Yeah, it's interesting, Skip, as an aside, uh, Werner Erhard, who began EST, the Erhard Sonar's training, he also went up through grade four in Scientology. Yeah, Jack Rosenberg was his name, and he was a used car salesman or something like that in San Francisco. He, he did it at the San Francisco uh, org. Yeah, you are and, correct. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I heard about uh, Werner from um, Michael Limbeck, who's now a famous uh, TV director, and his sister, Elaine Limbeck, who was a regular on Welcome Back, Cotter. 
and Michael uh, got into Scientology after Elaine got into it. Their dad was Harvey Limbeck, who was the best comedy uh, acting teacher in town. He had uh, John Ritter and Robin Williams and just about everybody in his class. And, and he used to be in the movies like Beach Blanket Bingo. He played a sort of a comically ah. tough motorcycle guy, you know, Eric Von Zipper. And, ah. uh, and, and Michael told me about, I asked Michael, what, what did you do when you were an S? And he said, I was a catcher. I said, what do you mean you're catchers? It's not a baseball team. He said, oh, no, you know, people would be in these seminars and they'd lock the doors and they'd try to get out to go to the bathroom. I'd catch them and throw them back in a room. <laughs> <laughs> so so we had S people coming in, you know, if it was a celebrity thing and everything, they, they pretty much thought S and Scientology were the same thing. You were, you were talking about something interesting, how the New York Celebrity Center was purchased. How did that become come about? Well, New York Celebrity Center was headed up by this vivacious redhead named Darby Simpson. And Darby was some kind of classed auditor. You know, I think she was an OT or something like that. OT3 maybe, maybe OT7, I don't know. And so she was tight with Yvonne. So she started the Celebrity Center. She needed a building. And she got a building by uh, getting a multimillionaire named Louis Scribnick, I think was his name, to buy the building. And he was into Scientology. And not long after that, uh, Darby ditched Louis. <laughs> sure. And, and Louis, uh, the reason I know that story is because I dated a girl who was uh, uh, at the Celebrity Center in New York. And then she was from out here and she came out here. And she had dated Louis Skoribnik, so she told me all kinds of stories about him and uh, the Celebrity Center in New York. And uh, Tamara Wilcox and, and the Interplay members, uh, which later included Jim Meskimen and his wife, Tamara, um, were the biggest draw at the Celebrity Center in New York. Uh, and also Jeffrey Pomerantz, who is now Mr. Adamant Scientologist uh, field staff member, whatever he is. But Jeff was on a uh, big soap opera uh, filmed in New York City, and he was a, he was a soap opera star at the time. Uh, you know, and so I went there, and it was, it was uh, reminiscent at the time I went there. I think it was 78 or something like that, reminiscent of the original Celebrity Center over on 8th Street in downtown Los Angeles. So it was a happening place. What's, what's interesting is um, Yvonne Chench started the Celebrity Center and, and, you know, and, it, and it grew and it's in New York. What were the differences between New, New York Celebrity Center and LA Celebrity Center you saw? Well, Celebrity Center New York had a big competitor and that was Helen Geltman. Helen Geltman had a long established Scientology mission and uh, she was very uh, active in getting new people into Scientology. So uh, one person who got into Scientology via Hel Helen Geltman was Christopher Reeve. And Christopher Reeve came out, uh, I think in 1976 or something like that. Uh, and uh, the celebrity Darby Simpson wasn't too happy that, you know, Mr about to be Superman was on Helen Geltman's lines, you know, uh, they called it. And, uh, but Helen won. And then Chris uh, had been on Broadway in a play with uh, Catherine Hepburn, and he was really the rising star. And I met him when he came out to play Superman. I didn't know anything about Superman being filmed because I was a staff member at the time. And we weren't supposed to watch TV much or read the newspapers because it was in theta, you know, would mess up our minds. And so Chris walked into the Celebrity Center on uh, La Brea and I was standing there one day and, and he was going to meet Yvonne and uh, asked me where her office was and stuff. And, you know, and I asked a little bit about him and he said, oh, yeah, I, I, I came out. I'm going to be in the Superman movie. And I was so naive. I said, so uh, uh, what are you going to play? And he sort of like <laughs> look, looked at me like, who is this idiot? And he goes, Superman. And I go, oh, yeah, I can see it. I can see it. You know, and uh, it, and he was he, he really liked Yvonne. 
and uh, they had uh, Yvonne and I think uh, Jane Kimber of the Guardian's office. They they'd arranged this big event to sort of prove Scientology was equal to all religions and we should all get along and have peace and stuff. And they called it Prayer Day, and it was held in Anaheim. And so Chris was a pilot, and he told me that day, he said, I'm going to fly Yvonne and Heber and the main uh, registrar at Celebrity Center, Hector Carmona, down to Prayer Day. And I said, oh, can I go? Because I was going to go anyway by car. Yeah. He said, no. He said, no. It's a it's a Piper Cub or something like that. There's not room. So I was like, oh, okay. So he was tight with them. I think he he uh, appeared uh, at prayer day a little bit. There was uh, introduced or something, and then he wanted to transfer his money from Helen Geltman's mission to Celebrity Center. It totally made sense to him. There's a Scientology place I already paid, but I'm going to be out here filming the movie. Let me let me do it at the Celebrity Center because I like them. They'll take care of me. Helen wouldn't do it. No matter what Yvonne did, got in touch with Hubbard, no, nothing. Wouldn't do it. And that's why Chris left Scientology because he was ready to continue doing auditing and everything while he was filming Superman. But they, there was such a uproar about it. And he just, he just said, this is bullshit, you know? Yeah. And I don't think he, I don't think he even said that in his memoir, but I distinctly remember it happening. No, that's interesting because uh, the missions are, are uh, basically there's this franchise operations designed to, to take people up to a certain level and they hand them off to the orgs. And, um, Tom Cruise came into Scientology through, uh, what was it, Phil Spickler's mission? I don't know. F Phil was in uh, Northern California, but uh, I know that, I don't I don't know, did Phil have a mission down here in uh, L.A.? I don't know. But, you know, well, Mimi, well, his, Mimi, Mimi and Jim, Mimi Rogers and Jim Rogers, her husband, moved down here and set up a whole field auditing uh, thing. And uh, then they were getting a divorce because Mimi was so dead certain on focused in on becoming a famous actress. And, you know, so I don't, I don't know, maybe if Phil had a mission down here or not, you know, but yeah, you know, I, Mimi got him in. So. Yeah. As I recall, yeah, Mimi Rogers is the daughter of Phil Spickler. She was born Miriam Spickler. Tom Cruise came in through a mission. So not, not all Scientologists come, uh, I'm sorry, not all Scientology celebrities come in through the celebrity centers others make their way in through missions and that was my only real point yeah Different ways well the the two celebrity centers that uh, did anything at all were celebrity center other than los angeles were celebrity center uh new york and then there was a, a short-lived celebrity center las vegas and they got people in like lou rawls did a communications course uh fred Travelina, who was a very famous impressionist at the time, he got in, and then uh, a, guy, a music act that was big in Las Vegas, Billy Tergresser, and somebody else. But uh, you know, I don't. They they were really kind of missions, CC style, celebrity center style. Yeah. Now, question for you: You mentioned Kirstie Alley, and she she said that. Uh, Scientology saved her from cocaine. You, what's the background? You know about that? Well, you know, uh, there were Don Purcell, I think it was, it, uh, who uh, got uh, the Dianetics and had it for a while after Hubbard bombed out in Wichita. You yeah, know? Which, yeah, the Wichita uh, Center. Yeah, there, there were a lot of people uh, holdovers from those days who got into Scientology in Wichita in the times we're talking about in the 70s. Mm. There, there was a Howard Wilkins uh, who started Pizza Hut and uh, the uh, Bobby uh, Cooper and Becky Rounds who were uh, rich kids. Uh, their grandmother was Gailey Coleman, Coleman like Coleman Lanterns. Yep. And, uh, and they were all from Wichita and, uh, and Scientologists. And uh, Kirsty was a friend of Ann Rounds, who was married to Bobby at the time, and her dad was a big lumber uh, yard baron or something like that in uh, Wichita. And so Kirstie kind of grew up well to do, I think. And she had a rich boyfriend that she told me about. Uh, Mimi 
when she and uh, Jim moved down and started a uh, mission, they were contacting everybody that they thought was doing anything in show business, which kind of included me. And so I was invited to this garden party at their house. And I went out and I had a MGB convertible. I thought I was a little bit of hot stuff, you know, I was I made, making some money writing and editing magazines and stuff. And so uh, Mimi had Kirstie Alley playing volleyball in the backyard and she was barefooted and i was like who who is that unbelievably beautiful girl and, oh that's kirsty alley and so uh you know i went and met kirsty and mimi insisted on reading something that i had written so i went out to the car I actually had something it was a treatment for a movie and mimi and kirsty stood there and read it while i watched <laughs> and i and i said <laughs> So, uh, you, you know, you're a class A auditor. You, what, do you want to be an actress or something? And Mimi goes, yeah, something like that. And Kirsty was, yeah, me too. You know, and so, and then Kirsty, I said, why don't you get into Scientology? He said, well, last year my boyfriend and I spent $100,000 on cocaine, and I, I realized that might kill me, so I had to do something about it. Yeah. An incredible story. You know, Al Jarreau, a lot of other jazz people, you know, like there's Stanley Clark. Who were the jazz people in, in early well, Celebrity Center? Friends of Al that got Al in were Louise and Monique Aldebert. And they were French. And they had a group. And they'd been involved with the Hot Club of France. You know, like Django Reinhardt. Stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and Chick was, Chick was legendary. Um, you know, I mean, the, uh, I had a, a friend... Uh, Chester Schneider, who was the main roadie on the Wings Over America tour in 1976, and he'd been my roommate back in Austin, and he called me uh, and said, hey, come to town. You want to come to the concert backstage? Yeah, you know, and I happened to be in a room at Celebrity Center, and Spanky was in there, Spanky Taylor, and uh, and I said, hey, can I bring her? And she was like, oh, Paul McCartney? Her great dream was to be, meet Paul McCartney. And I said, hey, can I bring a friend or two? He says, oh, I don't know. Uh, I'll see. And then it was like, oh, no, no, it's all sold out. We can't do anything. And then I said, and then Spanky goes, ask him, what if Chick Corea comes? And ah. Chester, go <laughs> Chester goes, let me ask Paul and Linda. So he walked across the stage where they were setting up, you know, getting ready for the concert. And Paul and Linda go, Paul goes, Chick Corea? Oh, hell yes. And so they, they made seats for us in the Inglewood Forum off to the side of the stage. And it was me and Spanky and Norman Taylor and Chick and Gail. And then sitting next to us on these folding seats were uh, Rod and Alana Stewart. And so we, we uh, saw the concert, you know, one of the best concerts I ever saw in my life. And then two days later, we were invited to this party at the Harold Lloyd estate and everybody in music business that you could ever think of was there. And they had uh, uh, John Belushi doing his Joe Cocker imitation, Nelson Riddle and his orchestra, Chuck Norris did a karate demonstration. Uh, when I walked in, I was standing next to Rick Nelson and he introduced himself to me, which blew me away. It was just, un it was unbelievable. And out of that, we got, um, We've got uh, Burton Cummings, the guess who, who uh, cornered me and Spanky uh, somehow during the evening. And he had just finished doing the drug rundown or the purification rundown to get off drugs with Narconon. And so we invited him in to Celebrity Center and we met Larry Anderson that night because Larry was a big magic star and had been the star of a touring company of a thing called the Magic Show that had been on Broadway. And so Larry uh, came and got in, you know, but, you know, jazz, it was really just, it was just, it was Stanley and it was Chick and uh, Al got in through the Elder Bears and then uh, Ayerto and Flora Purim who are from Brazil, they got in and um, they performed at a concert at uh, the Hollywood Palladium. 
you know, so there were a few jazz people that were around, but those were the the most prominent ones. Uh, Maxine Nightingale, she was a, I think Chick got her in. And then there was a place across the street from Celebrity Center on Franklin Avenue that became a real hangout. It was called $2 Bills. And lots of Scientologists would flock there. Uh, Paul Haggis and I started a Scientology writers group and we would meet there. It was a restaurant and a club. And, uh, you know, uh, lots of Scientology musicians would show up and people who were not Scientologist musicians would show up. Uh, Mike Garson would show up and play and he brought uh, Helen Reddy in one time. Uh, Sam Kennison came and did a stand-up routine, you know, and it, it, was, it was quite the happening place. So it was a real little, uh, at the, you know, the place on Franklin where it is now, it was a real little buzz, buzz kind of thing. And there wasn't any of the uh, anti-Scientology stuff that maybe there should have been. And this was even after the FBI raid and the Snow White deal and all that. It was just kind of a little artistic thing going on, you know? The Celebrity Center sort of allow that to happen. They didn't, this was not heavy ethics or anything. Oh boy, heavy ethics. Let me tell you about ethics at Celebrity Center. Celebrity Center was where everybody in the pack area who's a Scientologist went to get laid. It was <laughs> sex. It, it was sex central. You know, it really was. It, you know, I'll tell you the, the most horrible story. Um, so I, long story about how I ended up being a, a, an ethics officer, a volunteer for uh, advanced organization, uh, ASHO day, ASHO evening, uh, you know, uh, which they call, I think, foundation. Uh, anyway, so I, I was doing that after an OT3 uh, class four former girlfriend actress friend of mine killed herself. Uh, yeah, named Laura Hippie, and they they took her 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 cover of Celebrity Center off the wall in in the Celebrity Center, tried to act like she never existed. And uh, I say I say I'd saved her life one time while I was living with her, and I found out she was an alcoholic who would fool the e meter anytime she wanted to. So anyway, I ended up blaming myself, even though I'd done my best to straighten her out and it becoming an ethics officer. And I was two little tiny courses away from being a class eight of ethics uh, called a Scientology magistrate. You know, I was really into it. So I'm sitting there one day and an OT3 girl shows up in front of me and I knew her from when I'd been living in a house a block north of a celebrity center with Nikki Hopkins and Richard Kunto. And her brother lived in the guest house behind us. She's crying and she's all upset. And I'm like, well, what's, what's the deal with you? Well, well, uh, I found my soulmate, she said, but she said her whole track item. That's what Scientologists call soulmates. And yeah. I said, and I said, well, that's great. Why are you so upset? Well, they won't let me see him if I'm getting auditing. And I said, well, really, what's, why is that? And she hesitates and I go, what's the deal? And so Lisa's 32. Yeah. And, and she yeah. goes, <laughs> she goes, well, he's a little young. Yeah. And I don't want to mention oh. his, I don't want to mention his name, Skip. Okay. <laughs> but but it's, he's a, he's a very famous Scientologist alternative musician. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and his and, parents and, were living at the celebrity center with the whole family at the time, right? So she's she's uh, you know, doing well it's statutory rape, you know. Yeah. And and her twenty eight year old best friend who's an auditor at Celebrity Center is with the younger brother. And so I I hit the roof. You know, I said, This is crazy. Sure. You 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 guys can't do this. And I wrote what, you know, a knowledge report and I, I copied it to people and I, I, I sent it to the celebrity center ethics officer, uh, Dennis Young, I think it was. And did they do anything about it? I don't know. The parents got real upset, you know, like how could anybody expose our kids? You know, it's just natural sex or whatever the hell they thought. And Dennis, Dennis tries to declare an ethics condition on me 
for interbulating that is upsetting celebrities. <laughs> you know, the, the parents, you know, it's that's how crazy it was. It, and it was like that all the time. But you know what, Skip, this goes to exactly the hypocrisy in Scientology because there's one rule, one set of rules for celebrities and then another set of rules for everybody else. Oh, yeah. And it's and it's even worse than that. At, at that time in Celebrity Center, they had decided that there was the regular people on course and supposedly you had to be a celebrity or closely connected to a celebrity to be on course and get auditing there. And then there were the real celebrities. So they had regular course rooms on the lower floor and they had the celebrity course room on an upper floor. So Priscilla Presley and people like that would go to this and Ann Archer and stuff like that. They would go to the celebrity course room. So it was real, a real uh, hierarchical, uh, almost a caste system, you know. Sure, it depended who who you were. Now it's it's interesting. The, the, the double standard even applies to you know the bigger stars are the real celebrities. The so somebody who's who, Ann Archer has won an Oscar, you know, and an Academy Award should be quite different from someone who's doing a, a daytime soap opera. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was it was how much money can you provide? You know, that was really the criteria and how much publicity can you provide? And if you could do a lot of either one of those things, you could basically do anything as far okay. as Scientology was concerned. Sure. Now, g going back, I want to ask you uh, just about a few names. Was uh, Jeffrey Lewis active during your time? Oh, yeah. Jeff was uh, very uh, active. But Jeff, Jeff kind of, uh, he marched uh, his own drum. <laughs> you know, he was a drummer also as well as an actor. When I, when I first met Jeff, he was, he was a carpenter. And it was, uh, he was uh, doing construction work. It was over at Celebrity Center on 8th Street. And, he, you know, he was just very talented, very down to earth. Uh, nothing seemed to bother Jeff. He, he uh, got me to help him with a script one time. And uh, I, I went to his place out in Tarzana. And, and he had me and uh, Bobby Lyons and uh, Jack Skinner. Uh, he, he was going to have this staff writing thing you know and, and Juliet was 12 years old at the time and she was flirting with me <laughs> I couldn't believe it you know and and uh, and, and Jeff was the, Jeff was like Karen Black you know Karen was into Scientology but she she had lots of friends who in show business who were not uh, she she would not get totally been out of shape about, you know, if you weren't a card carrying member of the church or something like that. Jeff didn't seem to either. Right. So Jenna Elfman, uh, I met her when she, she first got in in 1989 or so. Uh, I knew Richard Elfman, who was uh, Danny's older brother, and, and Richard had the, the first uh, iteration of the group, and he called it the Mystic Knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, of the Oingo Boingo, and uh, that was really something, and Danny was in it. Uh, Dan, uh, Richard, my, after Rocky Horror Picture Show was such a, a huge hit, uh, Richard made this absolutely insane movie called the forbidden zone <laughs> and, mm -hmm. invite, and invite you can you can find it on uh, youtube and danny was in it danny played satan <laughs> really and, yeah he played satan and uh uh it was it was totally nuts and uh, uh richard screened it at the uh, new beverly cinema which quentin tarantino now owns and and he he made it to um have uh, uh, midnight showings and uh, make money, you know, make it a cool thing to come see. I don't, I don't know that it ever made a whole lot of money. It certainly wasn't a Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was much stranger than Rocky Horror. But there, that, but there's another example. Uh, Richard and his wife uh, lived in Venice, and so like Karen, like Jeffrey Lewis, like some other people kind of were out of a beatnik, hippie, bohemian type lifestyle so that 
they didn't get sort of into the lockstep of Scientology that so many others did. Now, who was who the most of, of the Scientology celebrities with whom you, you knew or uh, uh, familiar with, who were the most, you know, doctrinaire, hardcore Scientologists? Well, <clears throat> that depends. Um, if you're talking about sex, not none of them. <laughs> you know, when, <laughs> yeah. when, when Jeff Pomerantz first moved out uh, from New York, and he was, his, I think he had a part in uh, the Greek tycoon with uh, Anthony Quinn. I think Anthony Quinn was in it. Uh, Jeff, thought he's, now he's finally going to be a movie star. It never happened. But Jeff moved out, and he was probably in his late 30s or 40s or something like that and so he takes up with this 18 year old girl you know and that she's his soul his whole track item you know it didn't last long but it was kind of and the parents were kind of pissed off but jeff was a celebrity so it was sort of like hands off on him and uh you know and then jeff became one of the most doctrinaire uh, Scientologist of all, he was the one uh, leading the charge when they had prayer day, not prayer day, when they had the, the Portland crusade over the Julie Christopherson trial and that and every celebrity uh, went up for that thing. It was it was huge. Would you say that the Portland crusade, uh, that that was a very a defining moment for the celebrities had to decide whether they were in or out? Yeah. And, and you'd be surprised who, who was involved at that time. Um, uh, Frank Stallone, who I knew from uh, writing an article about him in an entertainment magazine that I was an uh, editor of, uh, Frank was in. I was surprised to see him there. And uh, Melanie Skyerkirk, you know, uh, Candles in the Rain and all that, she was there and she was into Scientology on the East Coast and she performed. And uh, uh, they had a big a chick. Korea and I think Stanley and they all came and played and they had a big stage that they built uh, next to the river on a, a park place and they had several performances. It was a, it was a big deal and it was it was really odd. It was I was I was not on staff at the time and I was I was many years a a public Scientologist by that time. I was a writer and I was writing for Freedom Magazine for the Guardian's office. And so in the trial, I went up there with uh, Rose Goss, who I'd worked with on magazines. And Rose was later um, Bart Simpson's, uh, you know, oh, she was her manager. Nancy Cartwright's manager. Nancy Cartwright's manager, yeah. And so, Ro so Rose and I were, uh, they had a, 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 a bench in front for the press and nobody was sitting there and so rose and i were there to cover it and we we're going to write about it for freedom magazine and so we were sitting there and uh, uh some of these top sea org execs came in and told us to give up our seats to the execs and i you know i looked at him and i said uh sorry buddy this is for the for journalists the judge won't allow <laughs> it. and they were trying to steamroll me and i said well go ahead you know, the judge is going to yell at you as soon as he, we leave. And so I, you know, I stayed there. And so it, it was a, it was a defining, I already knew so many goofy things about Scientology, but the, you know, the Scientology community was, was almost literally my family and had been for years, you know, because of my own family situation. But that was a turning point for me because I, I, you know, I didn't believe that Julie Christopherson was such an evil person because I knew some of the, the, the things. And, uh, you know, nobody beat them and got money from them much uh, before that, I think. And, uh, it, you know, and, and the money thing started to really be maybe more important than ever for the church sure that was uh that was a case that they uh they did not want to pay on and they didn't want to pay on the willersheim case and so that period where, where l ron hubbard uh dies around 86 and miscavige is transitioning in things start to change in the church but 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 skip i want to jump around to a few things okay uh 
Now, I'm just going to pick your brain. There was a, a, a song uh, written in 1970, Ride, Captain, Ride, by the band called Blues Image. Yeah. Now, that supposedly is about Scientology. Do you know anything about that, background of that? I know nothing about that, but it makes sense, knowing that song. Yeah, this is uh, Mike Panera, uh, uh, Skip Conti. Uh, it, it was a big hit, and I've been trying to get some background on that. And I've, I've not been able to authenticate the story. So now, so we'll, well let that the big, go. The biggest uh, pro Scientology song at the time, and a fantastic song was called, was by Jimmy Spiris, you know, and it's called I Am the Mercury. It's haughty. And really? he, he wrote that. Yeah, he wrote that specifically for Hubbard. And uh, it was on his first, his debut album, Isle of View. And, uh, you know, Jimmy was just amazingly talented and he would uh, particularly he was hugely popular in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, he would open for the Marshall Tucker band, uh, people like that. And uh, Yvonne would let staff members at Celebrity Center like Jim Calger, who was a very talented saxophone player, uh, go tour with Jimmy. And Yvonne would fly out to certain events and read uh, The Golden Dawn uh, by, by Hubbard. And none of us were smart enough to know at the time that The Golden Dawn was a straight Aleister Crowley thing. And it was kind of a homage from Hubbard to uh, Crowley. And, uh, and Yvonne even put out a record with The Golden Dawn on one side and another Hubbard piece called What is Greatness? On, on the other side. And Jimmy would read What is Greatness himself sometimes. If Yvonne wasn't there and the crowd would go, we want to hear the music. And he'd say, shut up. You need to listen to this. You know, <laughs> so, you know, but that's, you know, there's there was lots of musicians involved in Celebrity Center, well, I mean, Scientology, in and out. Uh, two, two guys in The Grateful Dead. Uh, were uh, into Scientology early on, or at least Dianetics, and uh, and got uh, Jeff Levin and Robbie Levin uh, into Scientology. Uh, and there was a Celebrity Center, short, very shortly of Celebrity Center San Francisco. It never happened. Uh, but you know, Nicky Hopkins, uh, when he got in, Nicky was a you know rock legend, pianist. I mean. You know, he was, you know, John Lennon's uh, played electric piano and imagine world tours with the Stones. Uh, just un unbelievable music. And he got uh, Van Morrison in, in San Francisco. And, and, you know, just like Jerry Seinfeld, Van Morrison went up through grade four and he liked it. And when he finished it, he put on a concert for all all Scientologists because he wanted to see what it was like playing for an enthusiastic crowd that wasn't stoned. Huh. And then, yeah, and then shortly after, shortly after that, uh, Van got out of Scientology and uh, um, put out No Guru, No Whatever, that album, you know. So he, he got real disillusioned real fast. They're probably asking for too much money. <laughs> Well, you know, that's interesting because uh, William Burroughs, uh, w certainly one of my favorite au authors, followed the same trajectory. He was in for about 10 years, much more extensively than people realize. Yeah. And uh, when Bill Burroughs left, he, he wrote a piece about wh about why he left, why, why he objected to Scientology. And uh, L. Ron Hubbard actually acknowledged it in writing. Yeah. You know, responded to it. Yeah, and, it was uh, called uh, up. You talking about up, cre up Clear Creek without an e meter and the Rolling Stone? Yeah, I believe that's it. Your your uh, your memory is amazing on that. I don't remember the title, but that was an interesting thing because that's a different era where where William Burroughs. Uh, there is a book out about how how Scientology influenced him, and and some of it shows in his writing. Uh, yeah, I don't, and, and yeah. I I think it's it's fascinating. Uh, that Van Morrison would have the same response. Skip, you made a very good observation when we were talking before the show. And I asked you why celebrities leave and you said they get what they want and they don't need Scientology anymore. That's correct. 
well, it that's makes absolutely correct. Yeah, it makes perfect sense because you 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 know if whether you're doing est Buddhism whatever, you might hit a spot where you just say, look, got what I wanted, ready to go. Would they tend to leave the celebrities alone when they left, or would they tend to recover them back then? What 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 did they do? They they would try to recover them. There was a guy named Don Terrian who was a recovery auditor uh, for Celebrity Center when it was over on Eighth Street. And so one day, and Don was, he kind of had his funny New York sense of humor. And one day, you know, I said, oh, well, who you, who you after today? And he goes, Leonard Cohen. Oh, hmm. what? Leonard, Leonard Cohen was into Scientology? He said, yeah, didn't you ever hear famous blue raincoat where he says, did you ever go clear? And so Leonard Cohen had been uh, in Scientology's New York organization for a good bit, you know. And Don had studied his uh, PC folders, and he was telling me everything that was in Leonard Cohen's PC folders, which he was not supposed to. Yeah. And he and he went and uh, tried to recover uh, Leonard and didn't get anywhere, and so they left him alone. You know, it was it, because you know it was about public relations. If if any of those guys who were no longer in Scientology ever went, God, you know, went to the press and said, these guys won't leave me alone. It was, you know, it was horrible. They were always walking a thin line of, uh, you know, hate and, uh, and, and love uh, it, with, the, with the public on Scientology. So, that, you know. That would be expected at that point. Nowadays, of course, they go completely, uh, completely rapidly foaming at the mouth and saying if a celebrity speaks out against them. Leah Remini in particular, look what they've done to her. And so it, it, it's quite, it's changed quite a bit. The, the, let me tell you one story. This is, the interesting thing is Hubbard, no matter what you did for him, at a certain point, he would just, he would just leave you behind. OK, uh, Yvonne Jench, I, I wrote a, a story for the Morton Report about her tragic death and how she was treated. It was horrible what he did to her. And Mary Sue Hubbard, uh, I asked Nikki uh, Merwin, her best friend and had been a communicator for 13 years. I said, what well, how did uh, he feel about when uh, Mary Sue went to prison? And he said, she said, well, he didn't like it when she got strip searched in Kentucky. And I said, uh, that it? He said, yeah, that's the only thing I ever heard him say. And Nikki was, was you know, hanging out with him and helped him look for a house in the Hollywood Hills. And then he wouldn't because there's too many Scientologists around. And here's a story probably nobody's ever heard. Robbie Levin told me this. When Celebrity Center was first being founded, uh, Yvonne, he was really tight with Yvonne, hanging out with her all the time. And so one time Yvonne said, you know, come with me. It was a Saturday night or something. We're going to go talk to John McMaster, the first clear. Yeah. And and so Robbie Robbie said they went over and and John was suicidal, just despondent, said said everything about Scientology and everything. It was a total fake. He'd been all around the world touting it. And he hated Ron Hubbard. And, you know, he didn't know what to do with himself. And, they, you know, they kind of brought his spirits up a little bit. But, you know, and Hubbard really ditched John McMaster because he's too popular. He was more popular with uh, uh, Scientologists and Dianeticists at a certain point than Hubbard was, you know. And so there was this intense jealousy that Ron Hubbard had toward anybody that got a little too famous. And he was also had... I think a great deal of resentment that he never made it huge in Hollywood like he wanted to. Oh yeah, those are points well taken. You know, you the one crime in Scientology was to be more popular than Ron, or to know more than Ron. Uh, the late Alan Walter, a very famous mission holder, once told me he was on the ship Apollo, and uh, a mission holder, I believe it was the fellow from Orange County came aboard and, and uh, he was being very successful and Ron wanted to know what he was doing to boom his stats, to really grow his missions. And uh, the guy just knew a lot more than Ron. And Ron, when he was leaving the ship, turned and uh, said to one of his subordinates, you know, destroy the guy, basically. And, and Alan overheard this. Wow. The guy was gonna, well, you know, this goes back to Don Purcell uh, in the Dianetics days. Don was on 
on the hook to take care of all the finances of Dianetics and all the, the bills, the mounting bills. So it was a lot of money. Ron was just burning through money. Ron resigned from from the Dianetics Center in Wichita, thinking he could he could just restart with the Dianetics College, then go into Scientology, right? Right. So so once what Ron resigned from the board and tendered his shares back to the board. Don Purcell immediately put the found the foundation into bankruptcy and then bought its assets out of bankruptcy, including the rights to Dianetics. Yeah. Okay. And and and, and the mailing list and everything else. And I think this is where this stems from is Ron knew that he had to own everything. So he immediately starts a fair game campaign against Don Purcell to destroy him. And Don finally just gives up and gives back the rights to everything. But I think it goes back to that. If we want to use a Scientology term, it was a major end ground for Hubbard to lose control, to lose his rights and lose control to somebody else. Well, you know, that, that reminds me, of, you know, I told you about the Rounds kids, right? Yeah. They, fun they funded uh, what was called a brilliant film company with uh, Randy and Jillian Eaton uh, in about 1978 or something. And those guys were going to produce uh, the script that Hubbard wrote, Revolt in the Stars, uh, after the success of Star Wars. And he had a copy of the Star Wars script because uh, Lon Tenney, who was a Scientologist and a production manager on Star, original Star Wars, uh, sent it to him. Uh, yeah, and uh, so he, he was going to do Revolt in the Stars. So I knew all the people at Brilliant Film Company. I was writing some scripts. I made a little money. And so, you know, I was friends with them and I was, you know, I'd, I'd hang out a little bit. And uh, they gave me a copy of the script to read. Well, the script had illustrations in it of Zemu, the bad uh, emperor, and and I looked at this thing, and it was it was the Emperor Ming right out of Flash Gordon. He had, it was Flash Gordon characters that he had, and so uh, I was being represented by Jack Gilardi at International Creative Management at the time. His secretary, Jackie Loria, was a Scientologist, and uh, across the hall. Sue Mingers was the biggest uh, talent agent in town, and she represented Barbara Strassen and people like that. And her secretary, Cindy Pearson, was a Scientologist. And so Cindy and Jackie took me out to lunch one day because they wanted to uh, read a thing of mine that they later tried to make into a movie. It's the same thing that uh, Mimi and this Kirsty read. And so they said, oh, you've read Revolt in the Stars? Yeah. I've read it. And so, well, what, what's it? Tell us a story. What's the story? So I tell him the basic story and Jackie go, Jackie, who was an OT said, Oh my God, that's a story of OT three. And I said, <laughs> I said, I know. And I didn't know, but I faked that I knew because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, you know, I thought if to myself, if that's OT three, I don't give a shit about it. And so, uh, Another funny instance happened. I, I would do word processing for law firms uh, over in Beverly Hills. And one day I'm in the lobby of this one law firm and these two guys, uh, Greg Stone and uh, uh, Ben Peak, walked in uh, uh, who were involved with uh, a brilliant film company. And, uh, and I said, hey, what are you guys doing here? Oh, this is our lawyer, our lawyer's office. And I went, oh, really? So I went back to the... Uh, uh, word processing area, and I said, I said to the lady who was a supervisor, "Hey, you know, is there a, uh, is there a, a brilliant film company? Do you remember seeing anything with him? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." So I ended. I went back there and I looked at the contract that they typed up for L. Ron Hubbard, and I read the terms of what he would get if uh, it went into production, if Revolt and the Stars actually went into production. And he was going to get six hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars, and I went, <laughs> "Oh, six, six, six. You know. And I'd heard him. I'd heard him say on the Philadelphia Doctorate course uh, uh, opening uh, tape, you know, about people complaining about uh, auditing people, and they turn into Satan in front of him. And he goes, "Huh. Well, who do they think I am? Ha ha ha. You know. So." Wow. so 
you know, so all these little things like this would always happen to me, little serendipitous deals, and uh, would, you know, finally end up into like, I, uh, you know, I'm done with this. I can't take it anymore. And, uh, and that culminated when I went to New York City and I was going to play Harry Chapin in the movie of his life. And uh, I was going to do a sequel to Alice's Restaurant with uh, Arlo Guthrie. And then neither movie ended up happening. But I got into Scientology because I was looking for a wife from another life. And that was, that was the main thing that I had been doing in Scientology. Every girl that came along, I, and I wrote a song. My best song that I wrote is called The Southern Wind. And I described the woman I knew I'd meet. And so uh, in Tamara Wilcox's theater uh, before Interplay, the night before I was going to go to Stockbridge and meet with Arlo, uh, in walks this woman who had dark hair and green eyes and a southern accent, just like I knew she would. And she walks up to me and asks me for the time, and time stood still as she walked toward me. It was really bizarre. So, I, you know, I got to talking to her, and uh, uh, one night I'm in L.A., she's in New York, and I said, what do you do in your spare time? And she said, oh, I go and look for uh, old books. Oh, really? Uh, what kind? Well, there's this one author that I really like, uh, you know, and so I look for books uh, by him, old original editions. I said, really? Why is that? She said, oh, I've got a poster of him on the wall. You'll think I'm crazy. And I said, no, 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 tell me. And she says, I think I used to be married to that guy. Huh. And, and, you know, and then I told her my story about how I'd read a book about the guy and his family. And I wanted a family like that again. And I was looking for the wife. And, uh, uh you know, I told her who it was and all that. And uh, six months later, we were married. And then yeah. she got, she, she'd she only done one course in Scientology. And she got freaked out by it and went and met with uh, John Atack. And she came back to the house in Burbank and she was all freaked out. She thought I'd divorce her. And I said, why would I divorce you? We've got two kids now, you know, I love you. And so I went and read the book, A Piece of Blue Sky. And then I called the, all the, some the main people that I was dealing with in Scientology and said, I'm done. Screw you guys. And so they came over in the middle of the night in Sea Org uniforms and tried to tell me that John Atack had been a, a heroin addict and you couldn't believe anything. He said, oh, I said, oh, he was a heroin addict. You mean like my old roommate, Nikki Hopkins or, oh. or my, my friend, Chick Korea? So Chick and Nikki are no good too. Uh, 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 uh. And I said, you guys get out of here. If you ever come back, I might hurt you. Uh, I will at least call the police and I'll most definitely sue you. And wow. I was gone from I was gone from Scientology. So I, you know, I actually got what I was looking for. Oddly enough, I was looking for this wife from a former life and I found her. You know, that is an incredible story. Skip, I'd like to talk to in the next part, remote viewing. Ingo Swan, Hal Puthoff, because that was another flavor of Scientology in the 60s and 70s. Well, you know, it's a very interesting thing, Jeffrey, because there were things that were actually real that were beyond the normal kin of people. There were Twilight Zone type stuff that I actually participated in and knew other people who did and proven past lives, remote viewing, all kinds of stuff. I think they would have been there. Uh, anyway, I know they would have been there anyway, but Scientology with a, with a science fiction background and the new age type thing sort of gave it a platform and it was kind of okay to do that stuff. So it, it, it's, that's a long discussion and I hope we, we could do that too. I want to do a, yeah, I would like to do a podcast on that because you mentioned you were writing for uh, Freedom Magazine and I know that they did a lot of work on COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO. Uh, counterintelligence covert operations and freedom was doing some uh, interesting work and so I'd like to get into like the myths what was really happening some of the claims that have been made for example one of the more spectacular claims is is 
claims, and I emphasize that word, is that the CIA wanted Scientology's remote viewing, so they kidnapped L. Ron Hubbard in 1972, substituted him for a body double. And I'd like to talk about things that, that are on the internet, you know, myth versus reality. Uh, okay, and, and, sure. And you knew Ingo Swan. Um, yeah, I met, I met Ingo. He came to Celebrity Center when it was on uh, La Brea in Hollywood. There was this huge, wonderful painting that uh, hanging in the stairway that Ingo did and gave to Yvonne. And I think it was uh, some remote viewing of him going past the uh, uh, Saturn. And, uh, you know, because Ingo described things uh, before there were ever any space explorations that uh, proved things that the uh, telescopes hadn't picked up. And, uh, you know, so. Well, would you say that the the uh, remote viewing crowd in Scientology was part of the Celebrity Center? Oh, absolutely. It was it was a it was a current that ran through everything. Yvonne uh, was uh, very tight with a guy, uh, Pat Price, I think it was, yeah, who was. Yeah, a former sheriff who was an OT7 and some of those guys and Pat's uh, crowd uh, apparently were going around and finding uh, the implant stations from aliens and destroying them. Hal Pudoff, uh, he's actually, uh, he had a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. Yeah. And he designed the CIA remote viewing program, Operation Stargate. And right. th this gets really interesting uh where where we start looking at some of those connections and what is myth what the cia did you know through stanford research institute and uh because this involves people like uri geller it involves it involves people um like cal Pudoff, who was an ot7 pat price right, right. and other people russell targ and all these and all these people, there are some Scientology connections, some of them, others of them not. Uh, there's a book called Operation Stargate, which it's interesting. It's written by a, a fellow who was a Mormon and he was recruited for Operation Stargate. And he but he was not in a he was not a Scientologist, but he knew all the Scientologists and um, so since that was part of Celebrity Center, did it come under the purview of Yvonne Jench? Or, yeah. or how would how... No, one time, uh, one time Hal and uh, Ed May, you can look him up. He was right there in S SRI. Uh, uh, Hal, May, Hal put off and Ed May came and hung out at Celebrity Center. And uh, you could go up on the roof of uh, uh, the the one on La Brea, you know, sort of look out over Hollywood and stuff. And so they, they were there for quite a while one day. And, you know, and I, I met Ed May, really nice guy. Hal was a little more sort of put off, <laughs> put off. -ish. But, uh, you know, I was fascinated and I talked to him about, about some things and, uh, and some of the OT power sort of things that uh, I'd, sort of witnessed in my own life a little bit some odd little things uh he was like oh yeah well that's that's really something you should come see us sometime and i said well i'm a i'm a staff member here and so i can't and, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. and it, 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 it is interesting and because some of those people are connected to people who later like ed dames wind up on art bell show and then the scientology gets stripped out of it so i'd like to kind of go into the history and development of that like when do you first hear about this inside of Scientology? They don't use the term remote viewing. Do they ter do they use the term exteriorization? How is it oh, exterior understood? E exteriorization. Exteriorization was the giant get that so many people thought they would find in Scientology would develop through OT levels or whatever, and that it would they'd be exterior with full perceptics. So in other words, you'd be outside your body, but it'd be just like you had eyes, but the eyes would be 180 degrees or 360. You'd have 360 vision up down, you know, like you're a big bubble floating around and one big eye or something. You know, that's what everybody really 
wanted to, to get. Uh, I, I was interested in that because I thought I can go and look at all kinds of places and just write about them, you know, and sure. leave and, my body in place, you know, so. Yeah, one of Hubbard's yeah, earlier, or, or, well, yeah, one of Hubbard's early tests, you were supposed to leave your body and go read a book or a newspaper in a foreign country. So, Skip, let's leave it at this. Let's leave off celebrities and start moving into the occult aspect of Scientology for our next podcast. Okay, that sounds fantastic. Well, great. Thank you so much for being on the show, Skip. All right, it's a pleasure. There's much more. It is. So we're going to go part three. We're going to go into the occult aspects of Scientology, remote viewing, exteriorization, etc. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. As always, we'll be in good touch.